Okay, good evening, uh, everybody. So I'm very pleased to, to have the opportunity to moderate this panel. And uh, the topic is very broad. My name is Philippe Monnier. I'm from Switzerland and Mexico, but I grew up in Japan and I am a business executive with different companies. And I live in about 10 countries for business, including two years in Mumbai, in India. Oh. And um, we have a very broad topic and also foreseeably eight panelists, even not everybody is here right now. And it will be a challenge to keep the time. So the initial plan is that every panelist introduce himself briefly and speak about his main thought about our broad topic, the world in 2030. In, in about four minutes, on it may be extended depending on the number of participants. On actually, I have a, a time watch. So when, when you see the time watch, you know that uh, time is more or less off. And then we will have uh, maybe a time for Q&A, for debates on, on some conclusion. I will have to leave sharp on time because I have another panel to moderate immediately after. Sure. So um, maybe I can ask uh, Gary if you would like to, to start and, and tell more about you and about your thought about this topic. Thank you, Philip. Can you hear me well? Yes, absolutely. So sure. we get there. Yes. Yes. So it's a good system. Very high quality. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with you, gentlemen, and uh, start the conversation. I'm a vice president for global initiatives at the U.S. Chamber of Commerce in Washington. We're the largest business association in the world. Uh, we are completely independent of our government. Been around for a century. It's a volunteer-based organization, uh, so no one has to join. And every year we have to persuade hundreds of thousands of companies that we bring some value. In the United States, that's not an easy thing, as you might imagine. Uh, so we are constantly campaigning. So good to think of us as the political party of business, big and small, from every sector, uh, every region of our economy. And we obviously follow companies, our companies that do business in other markets. So that explains our huge interest in investment in international affairs. Among other things, we manage U.S. in the Business Council in Washington and many other groups and have partners, including CII uh, and many others in, in different jurisdictions. Um, in terms of um, what we stand for, we are the last remaining business organization in the United States that is fully supportive of globalization. And uh, that, that feels lonely right now, but it also means that we have an important job to make sure that connections with other countries uh, on the value chains with political leaders of other countries are robust enough for our members to be able to do business. Uh, in terms of the future, we obviously don't know. Uh, but being a business organization, we have to be optimistic. There is no business on a dead planet. We have to believe that it will be around, that commerce will happen, uh, that exchange of goods and services and people will continue. One thing I want to say to open the discussion is that if you think uh, about an epidemic of the proportions that we are witnessing right now, it's not the first epidemic. But the response of government leaders has been entirely unexpected. Leaders from countries big and small, democratic and less so, uh, good and bad, they've all responded with the same decision to value people's lives much higher than the risk of economic shutdown. It doesn't matter whose life it is, whether that's in China or the United States, uh, it doesn't matter. All the governments have chosen to take an extraordinary economic risk, lose a lot of revenue, a lot of money, to save some lives. And those lives may not be the most valuable from those who have been saved. And yet it's an extraordinary example of a different level of humanity that I'm afraid would, would not have been the case 10, 15 years ago when epidemics would strike in the past, 
governments would do the calculus. I can save this many lives or I can shut down the economy. And the decision was always to save the economy. This is the first. And I think it gives us extraordinary, enormous hope that the, the value of human lives will now be given. Next time something happens, we know what politicians can do. They can argue about anything, but they will be saving lives. There's different levels of efficiency, different levels of competence, but the impetus is the same. Uh, we think that me, that actually augurs well, augurs well for humanity. If we can do that, we can address many issues together. And by 2030, we would assume that the constraints of our limited environment and finite resources will remain a hugely important factor for business planning, for investment, for trade, and we need to think ahead how to make sure that we can keep growing within the environmental constraints of this planet. Um, that's probably our number one strategic concern. Um, otherwise, this experience is, uh, is a wake-up call. It's sort of a dry run of what we should all be doing if we are in impacted by, by an epidemic. Uh, and we'll be much better prepared next time. Uh, business for sure and hopefully governments as well. Let me stop right there. So thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. Um, it's a very interesting because in, in many countries, we have the impression that in some countries, like in the USA or Brazil, life was not the priority, but more economy, especially based on the many statements of the US president and the Brazilian president. But maybe we will come back uh, later about this point. On now, if um, um, if you could, if you could um, um, take uh, speak about you and about your thoughts about this topic. Sure. Good evening, everybody. Thanks, Philip. Uh, my name is Vaibhav. I run a couple of fintech companies uh, based in Bombay, more on the lending side. And uh, by background, I'm a career banker. About 18 years with country's largest private sector bank, and then I start, uh, decided to start uh, these fintech firms. So I, the way I see it, uh, 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 the current scenario, I feel this is. Uh, 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 we need to now start adapting to the kind of uh, 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 the kind of life this uh, this pandemic actually has built for us, because it. Doesn't look uh, sound very good when we say ki that uh, because, uh, because because you can always have a, a Corona 2.0 also tomorrow. So see, not that I'm saying it will be there, but I'm saying you may have something very similar. So we have lived, learned already learned to live with uh, dread, uh, deadly diseases like AIDS and all. So we we don't find it any more any any anything which is. Uh, uh, which is really uh, uh, anything which is which is really any more any any odd about it though we still don't have a perfect uh, a perfect medicine for aids or uh, even cancer for for that for that matter but still we have learned to live with it but i think the way <coughs> things will change on two two sides of it one is basically on the social side <coughs> especially on the uh, urban areas in uh, the way offices would be structured i think there is a lot which is going to change in the way we used to operate these businesses, uh, especially in cities like Bombay or any other uh, equivalent city across the globe, where you might have offices uh, which might uh, ha be having, uh, you know, uh, distances between the room, more cubicles, more covered spaces, uh, people coming on alternate days, the, the structure of the cities in terms of how they travel, commute is likely to I feel will, it will go change. You can't have another scenario where uh, your metro or your uh, local trains will run the way they used to run in the past. So there are a lot of changes which, which are expected. I used also feel uh, businesses the way they used to operate. Uh, the business model itself will also undergo a lot of changes. Like for example, uh, businesses like 
a fintech might become more relevant uh there is definitely more technology being digital which we, which which we are already seeing so i think uh, i i i strongly feel uh, we will have to uh, adapt we will have to get adjusted to this style of uh, living where it will be social distancing will become a norm and also uh, honestly speaking i i uh, see by nature i am i am somebody who is very optimistic and i keep seeing the brighter side of it i feel the moment there is some medicine or something like that or things start getting opening up you i'm i'm sure uh, these businesses which we feel uh, restaurants or travel with, with, or airlines which look like Uh, going to dogs at the moment i feel you you should wait and watch how millennium millennium will 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 jump over these 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 kind of businesses and these businesses might have another round of uh, uh, you know uh, uh, another way of but but yes uh, one thing is true the way this used to operate on uh, you know these restaurants or those things these might definitely will have to adjust with the social distancing now otherwise i feel it is only a time to uh, for reset or reboot of the of the of these business model nothing more than that i mean that's my view of it mm-hmm. yeah. so thank you very much um asha um, the vibe uh, it it is interesting yeah. because i as i mentioned i i grew up in in japan and in japan we are used to to many things like social distancing we never touch people when we greet um so i think in a way we are sort of imitating what japanese are doing since uh, centuries um anil uh, could you s- s- uh, tell us who you are and what are you thought about this topic yeah um uh, my name is anil bhaskaran uh, i am an architect and urban planner who has been practicing in bangalore in india for last about 25 years um So when I talk about our world in 2030, I'd be talking about it from the point of view of an architect, point of view of an urban planner. Uh, due to paucity of time, I'll just focus on four points I thought are worth highlight being highlighted. Number one point is designing of the cities and buildings. From my point of view, view should be done. around the central themes of wellness and happiness of the people who use them for instance in the case of the building the occupants happiness and wellness and the case of the cities the ha- op- the wellness and happiness of the citizens the pandemic that has created the situation that we are in today has exposed how ill equipped the healthcare systems world over are to deal with such a crisis so we now are in a situation where we, we are um creating uh, we are converting auditoriums we are converting stadiums into makeshift hospitals but if you actually think ahead in fact we should have facilities healthcare facilities large scale health healthcare facilities that would cater to a crisis like this in future number one in fact they should become a a, a way of life for us so i've been arguing for a very long time a number of years now that happiness quotient and wellness quotients should be the judging factor should be the parameters based on which the cities and buildings should be designed that's number point number 1 point number 2 going forward i think we should get rid of fossil fuel that is being used well over and then uh, design our mechanical and mobile systems around solar power the cities and buildings and motor vehicles should be powered using solar power or electric power generated out of solar power and that will cut down the pollution it'll help reduce the climate change etc um so in this direction we already have the hyperloop we have now trucks being designed based on hydrogen fuels etc very good steps in the right direction So I think going forward, I can even predict that we would probably the world would be uh, exposed to anti-gravity 
mobile systems. In other words, I foresee a situation by 2030, we might even have anti-gravity based vehicles, which will make probably our roads themselves redundant. So that is another point that I would like to make. And while we are designing cities, we should have smaller cities, walkable cities. And while we are designing buildings, we should have buildings that can be walked up. So the notion that the bigger, the better and more the media must be replaced with the good old principle of um, less is more. So going forward, our motto, our guiding principle of life should be less is more. Uh, it's not that we have any option. I think we have been over consuming uh, the natural resources of this planet. We need to cut down. Point number three is the same point which I just mentioned, that is conserving the natural resources of the planet. We should try and cut down our use. We should prudently use the natural resources that we have. The last point, the fourth point, is leading a responsible life. I've been a proponent of responsible architecture. Architecture that reuses the material, architecture that would conserve the, the use of material, architecture that would uh, use less amount of material and power in, in building buildings, etc. So going forward, we should, whatever we should, uh, whatever we are doing should be aligned with the wellness of the planet rather than uh, anything else. So these are the main four points I would like to make within the four minutes I've been given. Thank you. <laughs> thank, thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Anil. Um, to, have to highlight the, the importance of wellness and happiness in everything we do. Um, so now, um, um, so Amar, um, welcome. So could you please uh, tell us uh, uh, more about you and about your main thought about this uh, important topic? Thank you so much, and I'm so sorry for uh, my delay. Um, no problem. In, in brief, I run a company called Shared Studios. We create immersive full body video conferencing environments and we've been doing this over the past six years uh, and a big part of that is at each of these sites we have fully trained what we call curators to connect their community to one another i think the big challenge and opportunity that this moment in particular is making clear to us is um, that at this moment when we are more connected than ever before we have the potential to learn from engage and collaborate but there are several things holding us back. One is mounting tribalism and habits of mind that prevent us from engaging uh, across difference. Two are limited networks. It's very few of us who are fortunate enough to engage in events like this to build a global network. And therefore on Facebook or LinkedIn, we're unlikely to make the kinds of collaborations necessary. And then three, some of the technologies at our disposal don't give you the value and feeling of being face to face. Uh, and so our company works across all three of these things. I think the one big idea I'll leave us, or I'd, I'd like to put forward is, you know, over the past 500 years or more, uh, we have built universities, libraries, and created roles like librarians and teachers in order to impart uh, a appreciation and organization of human knowledge to make sure everyone is born into the world, uh, is able to acquire this knowledge. And I think now at this moment that we're at when we're more interconnected than ever, where the decisions of one person uh, or groups of people halfway around the world have such massive effect, it's important that we as societies invest in connecting across difference and distance and doing it in meaningful ways. Uh, and I think that for that to happen, societies need to invest also in uh, developing what, I, what we're calling curators, but cadres of people who are globally networked and who can extend those benefits to their respective communities. So it's a bit of a a unique corner of an idea, but I think in 2030 or beyond, if we find that people are um, engaging outside of some of the enclaves they're currently in, um, that would be a very valuable step forward. Mm -hmm. So thank you very much, uh, Amar. Um, uh, now we'll see, uh, Asha, I cannot see you well because there are some, some message from Frank <laughs> on Sonia Abrason over your face. And I don't know how to remove those messages. I don't know if you have the same situation. Um, but um, so Ashav, could you to, to tell us about, about you and about uh, what you think of our big topic?
Hi everyone. Hello, hello. Uh, am I, yeah, am I audible? Yes, 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 yes. Thank you. So I'm Akash Bhavsar. Uh, I am the co-founder of WaterQuest Hydro Resources. Uh, first of all, I'm really uh, delighted, uh, you know, to join this e-meeting. Uh, I have very fond memory, memories of joining this physically in several Horatius events in the last few years. Um, so uh, the good, the brighter side is I have the luxury of joining it from my comfort of my own home. So, uh, uh, and I am sure, you know, all of you attending here, we, as uh, the previous speaker said, we are all fortunate to, you know, join this deliberation. And that also means that we are all safe and protected. So uh, what we do in WaterQuest, you know, we, we started working since, uh, I mean, it's a culmination of almost uh, three plus decades of work uh, on R&D, on sustainable water source management. And in 2015 is when we started uh, our company uh, by bringing in the research expertise uh, of some of my team members uh, in us coming together. In simple words, what we are doing uh, is trying to address the physical water stress uh, in terms of, you know, uh, like in several parts of the world, there were reportings that in during the COVID, you know, the per capita consumption of water also increased because of, you know, frequent, uh, you know, the silly of, of things of frequent uh, washings to hand washings. And uh, so the per capita consumption has increased. And, and this is, uh, of course, we are fortunate uh, probably that where we have this piped water available. But there are uh, more than uh, 600 million people uh, who do not have access, you know, uh, over a billion people actually who do not have access to uh, continuous drinking water or even regular domestic water. So what we are trying to focus on is create a decentralized infrastructure which can be done within a 90 day time frame and provide for, uh, you know, uh, either drinking, irrigation or industrial use water. Now, uh, the, the tech side of this is, and I'll relate to how it, uh, you know, uh, in my views on the post-pandemic uh, era, is, uh, uh, so what we are able to do is just based on the GPS coordinates of any part of the planet, we are able to predict whether there is presence of uh, sustainable perennial water sources, uh, at what depth, quality, quantity, and temperature. And with that, we work with various local partners globally and are able to create this infrastructure, go ahead, drill, create, and access this water. We've done this in 1,200 locations globally in 16 plus countries. And uh, we were also ranked uh, uh, recently, I mean, not recently, but 2017 as one of the most innovative companies by Fast Company Magazine. Uh, our aim is to create a decentralized water infrastructure and measure water consumption, uh, availability, uh, accessibility, and the quality in real time. And provide this, uh, you know, not just the information, uh, not just water, but also the information about water to utilities, governments, you know, industries, uh, farmers, etc. Now, with that as a background, uh, you know, my, my view on the topic essentially is that, uh, you know, what COVID has shown that uh, the globalized uh, supply chains, you know, are uh, extremely fragile. You know, in terms of uh, the dependencies which it has created, and we are seeing a lot of, uh, you know, uh, uh, a lot of challenges with respect to the physical logistics and transportation of, uh, and the dependencies thereof, uh, with the large scale, uh, you know, su supply chain right from uh, pharmaceuticals to electronics to other things. Uh, so, uh, and and I who come from the fusion of technology and the infrastructure field, so is the old and the new school. We have been promoting and we see more so that the need for decentralized infrastructure, which would mean decentralized power, decentralized uh, healthcare, decentralized water source availability or water availability to uh, be able to create, uh, you know, uh, grids. Uh, so something which is decentralized micro grids. So it is not, uh, you know, it's, it's not creating... Uh, something which will work in isolation so it works as part of the whole but is also sustainable uh, in its own right uh, so that is something with today's technologies including uh, the renewable tech uh, renewable energies and some of the solutions like water water quest has and some of our other technology partners 
where we are able to bring the whole decentralized water and environment and wastewater uh, sort of an aspect. With uh, healthcare, we have a group company uh, under SkyQuest, which does you know fantastic uh, amalgamation of really advanced tel- uh, healthcare diagnostics and you know surveillance products, not surveillance but uh, monitoring products, which can provide you know in the remote villages very high quality access to healthcare uh, and diagnostics. So uh, we see this um, uh, as one of the important uh, 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 themes going forward of uh, decentralization and uh, you know using of technologies uh, both machine learning uh, in terms of you know also on protecting the data the blockchain the application of that uh, and also uh, in terms of uh, combination of renewable energy and some of these aspects coming together so yeah, i'd like to pause here and that was uh, my view and be happy to contribute later Yes, thank you very much, Akash. I have a, a question to you. You say that we should have decentralized infrastructure and you take the example, your example of, of water supply. But if I take a country like Switzerland, we have 7 million inhabitants. We have 26 states. And I would say we have at least 40, 50 companies that supply water. And we rather have the impression we are too decentralized. We should be a little bit more, I would say, efficient. So w- what is your comment about this thought? Okay. Uh, well, uh, so one of the most important things that despite, uh, that is where, uh, you know, as coming on the technology side, my comment would be that despite multiple players or otherwise, what is important is that if we are able to reduce uh, what is called the non-revenue water, which globally today stands at almost 48%. And what does that mean? That, uh, you know, for every liter produced and transported, for you know, 480 ml of that is either lost due to leakages or pilferages. Probably in Switzerland, it may be not as as low as that. But, for example, in a country like India or parts of Africa, it can reach anywhere between 40 to 60 percent, which means uh, you know it's it's a massive inefficiency, which can be solved using today's uh, you know at least real time detection in terms of the uh, you know basing uh, using sensors and satellite data uh, to real time detect. Now for this, either there could be more centralized agencies who do this, and mostly it is with the government, but the last mile delivery would still be decentralized. So the data can get centralized. Uh, but the last mile delivery can still be, you know, uh, uh, you know, decentralized. Now, uh, again, the, specifically, if uh, we were to take the example of the water sector, one of the very important things is that unlike power, uh, there is a lot of uh, challenges with respect to the, uh, you know, the the, uh, the rights versus how you can do the trade of water. So the rights of access to water, and that varies significantly in country to country, right? In the US, which is one of the, it's one of the most regulated, but with regards to water, water concessions are the most easiest to come by in North America. Whereas, for example, in uh, in, in Spain, you can get concessions fairly easily, but it's still regulated. And in country like India, uh, where uh, you know, the groundwater access is, uh, is highly regulated, despite uh, a lot of things uh, people may do, but it's an extremely regulated uh, uh, market. Mm-hmm. However, enforcement is another matter, right? So, so these things, uh, you know, it's it's uh, in these areas like water and energy. I mean, energy and and water. Uh, we need to have uh, you know a superstructure of governance. So that's why governance is very important, which needs to be centralized. But the technology can be used to execute uh, and enforce uh, in a decentralized manner. And um, so, uh, I know I was not able to answer directly to the Swiss question. But I thought, uh, you know, I wanted to kind of paint the mm-hmm. picture on the general landscape. Yes, mm, thank you. I have a question to, to Gary. You, you said that the, the most important thing in the response of governments to this COVID pandemic was to value life, to save life. And we could add to save more or less one or two years of life for people who were very old and already very sick. But actually, we have the impression that 
in, in some countries, like maybe in France, maybe like in, in, in uh, Italy, they, it was an absolute priority to save life, even though it was a life of very old people, very sick people. But in other countries, we, I have the impression they had a more global view. Only this global view included to, to keep the economy more or less alive and to, to, to think that if there is an economic disaster, we will lose life for other reasons. Well, those countries who have been a little bit more aggressive in this sense is USA, Brazil, Sweden, maybe UK at the beginning, Singapore. So what is your, 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 your thought about this? The United States went to a shutdown that I had never seen before. It was done at state level, it was done at federal level, it was done at personal level. We are now slowly getting out of it, and every state is doing it at a different pace, which is a reflection of the incredible diversity of the situations in the United States. What works in Vermont, the social distancing is the norm, it does not work in Louisiana, but that's impossible. But the priorities of all of the policymakers was to dramatically clamp down on economic activities. We could not do it because of our legal issues and culture, the way China has done it. Every country is doing it differently. But we've lost six months of production in the United States, which is an incredible blow. And it was only possible because the government has provided sustenance and livelihood to all of the people who are forced to stay home, lose jobs, are not able to take kids to school. Without the financial support from the government, that would not have been possible. So we've done an incredible job. Could it, it could have been done better, of course. Could it have been done sooner? Absolutely. But if the fact remains it was done, even despite the ideological conviction of our leaders. They had to do what they did not want to do. That's my point, that the political situation is such, even in the United States, I'm not gonna comment on Brazil, but in most countries, maybe with the exception of one or two, that regardless of the personal persuasion of the president, the prime minister, whomever, Everyone had to sacrifice an extraordinary part of the economy um, to save a few lives, to, as you said, to, let, to extend the livelihood uh, of some people. And it was done in a situation of high uncertainty. Nobody knew how long it would last, a few weeks, a few months. Well, we still have to continue our partial shutdown. Uh, I'm speaking to you from the suburbs of Washington, D.C. <coughs> Second day that some stores are open, uh, the streets are empty. The government is still in, you know, demanding that businesses invest a lot of resources before they open up, uh, and that will cost. But that's fine. It's, it's sort of, we're no longer measuring the saved lives with dollars it's not a balance that we are accustomed to. Three years ago, we would have had economic saying <coughs> this many lives saved. That's how much money was lost. Let's find the equilibrium. It's not even part of the discussion. You have to do what you have to do. And again, uh, as one of the speakers has said, the, the fragility of the public health system is tremendous. And hopefully we'll all learn the lesson both in terms of planning, uh, urban development, uh, public health systems. There are lots of things that don't work well. Uh, but yet the decisions were made and the decisions were the right ones. Mm -hmm. Th thank you, Gary. Uh, I have a question to, to Vaibhav. I, mean, I understand that in India the lockdown has been very severe and is still very severe. But at the same time, how, how for instance, in Switzerland, the, the, the lockdown was not so severe. It was half lockdown. 
but still the government <coughs> fortunately has a lot of surplus. So they invested the saving of maybe 50 years in, in one or two, three months to help people. So there were a lot of, basically you have one third of the population in Switzerland who receive more or less state salary now for, for three months. But I understand in India, the lockdown was even more severe, but I suppose the government didn't support people so much. So how did, did people live without working, without receiving any kind of uh, support or limited support from the government? Okay. So there are two, three things over there. See, India was either ways because of a few structural changes in tax, like something like GST, the uh, post demonetization effect. And also business slowed down. There was, uh, there was either way things were, uh, things were moving slowly in the country, uh, especially for the MSME uh, uh, sector. Mm -hmm. So uh, it would be wrong to say that, yes, uh, the government hadn't supported, supported in any manner. Government has, has supported, but the support has also been limited. One has to understand uh, India is, uh, is, a, is an emerging economy. <clears throat> the kind of resilience which countries uh, in Europe can actually show uh, to tackle uh, this pandemic, India cannot show. So it, it it has to be a very, very balanced approach. And I strongly feel the government has done a good job. They have left a lot of money, a lot of schemes and have also pushed uh, the banks to start lending also to these businesses. So the businesses can uh, can, can, can restart their uh, <clears throat> can, can restart. And also to control some kind of unemployment, which we, we are actually, you just mentioned that how people are living their life. Yes, a lot of people have lo lost their jobs and there, 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 there may be a scenario where in the next couple of months, there could be more job losses. But I strongly feel uh, if I if I really leave that short term impact in medium to long term, India will be in a much better position because uh, Indians uh, by nature or by culture are used to uh, uh, adjust or readjust to to, 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 to to situations. We have done that uh, 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 all the years in 1000, 2000 years, 5000 years since the time the Indian culture has been. So that upskilling, reskilling is basically something which is required and I think everybody has understood and which is basically an effect of any technological change also which al always happens. So I feel uh, short term, yes, there is a, a problem. But I think medium to long term, uh, things will be better and India will cope up better. It is already coping up. We have a capable government, which is doing whatever needs to be done to actually uh, uh, minimize the effect of a pandemic. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes, it's a, thank you. It is a very interesting because I, I ask many people, uh, how come if you look at the CEO of the top companies in the world, you have many Indians, uh, Google, uh, Pepsi, uh, um, I mean, on, on, so what, what is the reason? So the answer is, okay, there are many Indians. So this is part of the reason. Another reason is that Indian, they are, they are used to fight. They're used to adapt. They are used to find solutions. They live in uncertainty. So this is, this is uh, to live in India is a very good school of management uh, under uncertainty. And this is a little bit what you, you said, this uh, ability to find solution despite the difficulties. Just just one addition. See, it's not that Indians are uh, Indians are the only breed who, which is hardworking. It is Chinese also which is hardworking and then in many other countries. But in but what is what makes Indians different is Indian is Indians are uh, I would say very very good when uh, uh, while finding an alternate way of doing things which is not the case with the most of the uh, 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 people in other countries, honestly speaking, beyond being hardworking, hardworking is one they say, I, I don't think it is, it is the most necessary quality, uh, uh, we, 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 which is really there in all the CEOs, which are based in US. It is, it is the other thing, actually, how, how well you explore or what are the kind of ideas you generate, how well you implement those other things. Otherwise, Chinese are more hardworking than us. That's what I, I feel. Mm -hmm. Because in a country like France, when people is born, they have the impression everything is due to them. The state yeah. has to provide good education. The state has to provide uh, good, good uh, health care on, on the vocation, on, on happiness. But maybe in other countries, people are more used. I have to think, I have to get all this. It is my responsibility. It is my effort. I have to find a way to find a solution to, to, 
to make a living, to, to have a good hands, to take care of my family. And I think this is a, a good mental exercise. Would anybody like to ask question to a norm, another panelist? If it is not the case, if you don't mind, we will close this session because uh, my next session starts in five minutes and I have to be a little bit before. So I think it was really great to, to, to have you to discuss and exchange with you. And I'm sure we will meet probably in a, in a real uh, Horasis event, uh, which is even better. And, and so thank you again for your participation and have a good uh, evening. Thank you. Uh, for rating the show so very well and uh, nice meeting all the other panelists. Uh, thank, you. Thank, you. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.